all the video, as I said, uh, will be posted on YouTube. I think I forgot to do it last week, so I'm going to keep doing that. I'll make sure everything is up uh, at least a week before the exam, uh, except for the last video, which is next week. It might take like one or two days for uh, for me to process and for YouTube to upload it, right? And if you kind of realize that my video, I, I don't like cut the beginning, don't cut the end. I have to apologize about that. I, I typically, I, I might eventually come back to that, but most of the time, because I'm teaching other classes as well, uh, I kind of basically have to just upload whatever I have. So you see this, just fast forward, right? <laughs> uh, so let's come back to our processor design. And as, as I've been mentioning, right, right now we, we are, uh, since the, since I guess the third lecture, right, multi-cycle execution, everything we are trying to do is how to be, how can we speed things up? How can we make the CPU faster and even faster and faster and faster? How many of you watched the Apple events? Yes, uh, not yesterday, on, on Tuesday. Or at least check out the new iPhone and their specs, right? So if you've done that, one thing that you might realize is they have a new ship again. I mean, that's like the Apple thing. Every every time, every year when a new phone comes in, uh, they, they have a new ship, right? How about Android? Most of the time, every year they'll use another ship as well. Most of the time, I think it's like Qualcomm Snapdragon ship, right? Uh, this useful Android phone. Some of them use other ships as well, as long as it's basically compatible with the Android OS, they're fine, right? One thing that you might have realized is like these chips are now blazingly fast. So if you look at their benchmark, it's kind of like compatible to i7. <laughs> Think about it. You use i7 for, for your desktop, right? And now your phone, which is like way smaller, has a shift faster in many cases than your laptop. Think about that. And one of the things that you might you might have not realized is how much how much of the sorry. If I disconnect is basically my cat. The reason I'm kind of like partially late is also because of them. And they're like they're fighting back here. Uh, I I guess they're playing, but like playing fighting. Uh, Give me one No, hung. All right. The culprit want to say hi. And the other cat is literally eating tissue paper. Oh. All right, I buy toilet paper for my cats to eat rather than for me to use. Okay, I'm back. Uh, so yeah, if you look at those those chips, right? They're really fast, but look at the size of the battery between your laptop and your phone and look at how long those things last, right? So if you op uh, turn on your phone for a long time, right? They basically make it always well, not not always on in the terminology of like those always on uh, screen where uh, some of you might uh, like to have. Uh, personally, to be honest, for me, I don't care. <laughs> but if you turn it on and use your phone versus using your laptop, they last. Actually, sometimes your phone lasts even longer, right? The fresh phone, not 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 this one that is like seven. I think six or seven years old, right? This thing would last like 20 minutes and gone. Uh, maybe like probably 40 minutes back. Um, it's because of their power budget, right? I think if I recall correctly, the new ship uh, power is about eight watts. Most of your laptop's uh, power is like something like 40 watts. <laughs> so, so they also have to somehow make sure it's not just fast, but it's really power efficiency is really high, right? Uh, you might have seen. How about you? How many of you heard about M1 chip, like battery, battery, uh, the battery life of the the MacBook that use M1 relative to like other laptops? 
that thing also lasts like forever as well, right? So these are another type of optimization you can do. How can you make sure the battery lasts forever? Well, not forever, but like use less and less power without sacrificing performance, right? Uh, if you look at performance versus power, that'd be the, the sweet spot that each company would pick. I want more performance, it would consume more battery. If you want more battery life, you would consume less performance. Sometimes you push everything out together, right? And also this uh, technology node, if you haven't realized already, when you have a smaller technology load from say seven nanometer to five nanometer, which is the, the Apple uh, A15 chip, right? From seven down to five, you get roughly about 10, 15 to 20 percent more transistor given the same area because you literally shrink the size of your transistor, right? It means you can pack more things and each thing would consume less power for each individual transistor. So these are these are some of the gradual steps that that may come faster. And this thing that we're going to learn today is like one of the major part. One of the major part on why, how, yes, sorry, cat again here. Here. Uh, uh, on how can you, how can you make computer computer faster? And this is like the main thing on the CPU side. Once you're going to the GPU, we'll drop many of the things we learned here. We'll drop many of the things we learned here to use a totally different techniques because the type of the program the GPU run, which is data parallel program, it is a one unique type of multiple uh, multi-threading. It's called data parallel program. It gives you unique assumption that make the GPU blazingly fast. But if you use the GPU to run any program, it would suck, right? Just don't trust the, the, the story that say, hey, GPU is good at doing everything, no. They're, they're bad at doing many things. They're really bad at doing many things, but they're really, 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 really good at running certain things. That's why it's so useful, actually. At the, in, the, in conclusion, GPU is super useful. It's a really, really good thing. I mean, I did a thesis on the GPU, so so I'm I'm backing it too. I'm, I, 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 I like how the GPU works, right? And there's so many types of applications that will be really fast on the GPU. But it doesn't work for everything, and that's another thing that most programmer doesn't understand. Uh, and then sometimes they're surprised, like implementing code on the GPU, trying to run it. Oh, it's so slow. Uh, yeah, of course, it doesn't even have out of order execution. So if you compare that to the CPU, many of the things you're gonna run, it's gonna, it's gonna be faster on the CPU. All right. So uh, before we begin, uh, we'll go through your project proposal next week. If there are any problem, if there's no problem, you'll be fine. I'll say, yes, please go ahead and do it. I'll change that to like, hey, how much things, anything I can help to make sure you can progress through the project. So it will be, it will be more of a, not even a checkpoint, but me check, check, checking you. Like, hey, are you, do you have any problems? Uh, are there updates that you want to discuss with me? Treat me as your kind of like, say my advisor in the sense that you kind of want, want to finish the project. Uh, what can I do to help you finish the project? All right, uh, it won't be graded. Again, as long as you submit uh, that, uh, what you want to, which what have you already done. So don't worry about that. I kind of know what both of you want to work on. Uh, for Muhammad, just be a little bit more explicit on the parts that you want to accelerate and uh, use multi, uh, multi threading. Uh, eventually, basically make sure I'm aware of like what is the algorithm want to run, right? Uh, yes. So I want block off one last hour. So I'm going to basically review. If you have the, the, the time, you review that yeah, there's another announcement toward the end of the class, which means uh, basically it kind of involved me having to leave a little bit earlier uh, because of the, uh, I, I like all the lecturer has to be interviewed next Thursday uh, because of the, there's like another, uh, 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 I guess I'm, just, I'm not sure how should I call it, but it's like the 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 group of people that would kind of evaluate the quality of uh, each uh, university's program, and they 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 typically have to do interview for all the lecturers uh, uh, once a year. I I don't know how they what's that thought process of like I can just interrupt any classes 
uh, screw them. I hate that, right? So I'm sorry at the time that I have to like, kind of leave earlier. I try to make my case that at least make sure I can leave at the end of the class, not in the middle of the fucking class. I'm sorry to use a swear word because I think it's not fair for you, especially when this group of people are basically evaluating the quality of the program. They don't, they should not fuck with a class, right? I'm sorry I use a swear word because I'm so pissed about that. Uh, and, and and this is basically like why are they powering uh, all, all that inflexibility on you guys, right? It's, it's wrong. This is why we never kind of come out of like a third world country in Thailand. So many things that are like, it should be more flexible. It should be to the benefit of whoever uses it. Like why, right? Uh, anyway, uh, we will also review all the material so far uh, next week. Uh, and I think that's all. So uh, let's actually go through the 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 lecture, right? Uh, here is the review of precise exception. Can can someone tell me what is an exception? Exception is like yeah. uh, something uh, uh, when processor do not know what to do. Uh, uh, for example, uh, division by zero or something uh, like that, or pointing to the uh, wrong address. I think. Then, yeah. yeah. Perfect. Yeah, it's, it's something the program run into. Is like I don't know what to do with that because I never. So think about this way. Think of a computer as something something really really inflexible and i would say dumb right unless you tell them how to handle things they'll be asking you how to handle things exception is their way of like raising their hands like i don't know what to do with this right so uh it's a good thing that they did that because you as a programmer can come in and handle that so the issue is if you use multi-cycle execution or even with pipelining, right? You still want to make sure things are done in order. Uh, what does it mean by that? So if you code your program and you have a bug, right? You want to make sure if you look at assembly code, it, it might not be even on your code or when you compile the program, the compiler can kind of switch things up a little bit. But if you look at the assembly, somehow you need to know for sure the hardware has to guarantee things are done line by line by line by line by line so by this point i, I think i repeat this like more than 10 times so i think this should be clear right and as you said the exception is like something that are caused by the running threats this is handled when you detect it for example divide by zero sometimes you have a try and catch right you are, are you all family with try and catch Basically, it's like a block of code that say, hey, if exception happen, try to do this. Try to catch it, eh, something happened, so let's do this, right? If not, if not, it would kind of like, what would it do? It would crash the program and you basically see the exception and you, you, you know what happened, what line caused an exception, right? And so this is handled based on the process priority. If you do try and cache, it will be handled. If you don't do try and catch, Sorry, don't walk on my keyboard. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what's up with my cat this morning. I think they were fighting before, even before I wake up. I came down and everything is like everywhere. Um, so you do if you don't do try and cash, uh, basically it would cause an exception to the runtime. Runtime say, hey, I'm I'm gonna stop running because I don't know what's what what am I gonna do with the program. Go handle that. Interrupt is a little bit different. Interrupt is, is caused by external factor. Like when you type on the keyboard, uh, if you use Linux, if you do control C, what would happen is it would actually stop. Uh, some, uh, it's either it's control C or control C, uh, C Charlie or C Zebra. <laughs> it would either stop or, or like kill the program, right? So, so those are interrupts. Basically, these are external to the running of the thread. Like the program has nothing to do with that interrupt. It's just a human or something else, right? That caused the interrupt. Sometimes network packets come in, right? Network packets come in, someone has to handle that. The thing about interrupts and, and like this 
I guess. Unpredictability when the interrupt would happen. That's why the way it's handled is different. This is handled by convenience by uh, by the OS, and the priority can be varied, right? If the if the interrupt is tied to a certain program, the OS basically feed the program. Okay, something did this. Someone did this. Handle that, right? And from the like a software engineering and programming point of view, basically you build a, a function to handle those interrupts, and you're done. Yay, right? Uh, then precise exception means that whenever these things occur, we want to make sure we still preserve the sequential semantics, especially in the case of like the instruction that caused the exception. Right? Instruction that caused the exception because anything that happened before that instruction has to finish. Anything after should not finish. So we want to maintain that. Why is that the case? Because we want to make sure we enforce von Neumann. We want to enforce von Neumann model, line by line by line, sequential execution of things, right? A big part of von Neumann is you run code line by line, and it helps the software debugging. The thing is, in order to get performance, we want to basically change this to data flow, right? When we wrap things up, is you will realize that basically out of order execution is imitating data flow program without the programmer having to program in data flow. Because what, what is data flow? Can someone tell me what is data flow? What's the difference between data flow and von Neumann? Uh, data flow depends upon the order of the data as soon as the data is available, uh, the instructions execute. Yeah, but, it's like if I have all the operands, I'll just fire it off because I, everything is ready. Why wait, right? This is this is like a a fast way, fa uh, hopefully faster way to do things. I have all the operands ready, so I'm gonna fire the instruction off uh, right away, right? So this means that data flow is likely to be faster than von Neumann. But in terms of coding, if you if any one of you try functional programming for like uh, on a language like Scala or Rust, right, it's really fast. For, for, especially in the case of Rust, right? If you want to try something that is safe, easily ma uh, manage memory really fast and really parallel program friendly, I definitely recommend this language called Rust, R-U-S-T. Uh, it's a little bit unique. Uh, but if you're curious about it, feel free to try. And if you run into things, uh, it's kind of like um, a more structure of the Go language. Go is also another language that kind of support parallel programming really well, right? Uh, Rust is another language that supports parallel programming really well, and it has a lot of construct to make sure that things are safe. So hopefully, when whenever you finish compiling, it it is likely to yield fewer bugs, especially memory related bugs. <clears throat> but if you've done that before, you know how painful it is to so kind of think in the data flow, in the in the data flow way. <laughs> so things don't go line by line anymore. It, it goes like everything kind of gets fired off whenever you have data ready. Right? That's why it's fast, actually. Uh, so the hardware imitate the data flow for you. So from the programmer point of view, right? from the programmer point of view, is magically get fast. Things run out of order without anyone noticing, right? While you're programming your program in uh, one Neumann way, and your program suddenly becomes data flow and becomes fast. Today we will do some discussion on what's the limitation, right? I mean, this seems like a magic. Why, why, why we still need to somehow program in data flow sometimes. Uh, or using the data flow model somehow, and why is that faster, even faster? So we'll talk about some of the limits of the out of order execution. But uh, then we talk about how to process, how to make sure we have this precise exception, right? So the technique to maintain sequential state uh, with the recap on pipelining. So we have everything here. Let's say the execute caused the exception, right? And this is instruction number N with super scalar architecture. Let's say instruction N plus one, the future instruction is here. The later instruction is here, and this is N minus two and N plus two, right? 
which one here, if n cause an exception, which one of this, these instructions here has to finish? Uh, n plus 1 and n minus 2. n, n minus 2 and n minus 1, actually. Right? Because from your sequential point of view, because we are doing things out of order. This is super yeah. scalar. So we're doing things out of order. n minus 1 is way back in the decode. It might be because of n minus 2 is generating something for n minus 1. Right? And I'm waiting for that. n plus 1 is like, hey, I have no dependency. I'm going to go ahead and run it. And N was like, hey, I'm behind you. And N suddenly caused an exception. Right? So what you have to finish is this guy, for sure, right? This guy, for sure, because that, that, that thing caused an exception. So I need to see what happened. Then this guy, because it's the instruction before N. And then you need to make sure this these thing and these things stay in the pipeline somewhere so that when you resume, you're ready to resume anytime. But the programmer should not see what happened in N plus one and then my app uh, N plus two. It should be hidden somewhere, right? So that's the beauty of what we call this thing called reorder buffer. Reorder buffer. So it, it's kind of being added to the decode stage because this happened in when decode happened, right? But it works with the write back. Basically, it's kind of like a two stage structure where when decode happened, you allocate the entry. When write back want to kick out one instruction, hey, I'm done, you kick out the oldest one. What it does is it basically keep track of what's been what's in the pipeline and it has the time time order of the sequence of things, right? And we talk about super scalar where the idea is, well, we, we still assume in order instruction retired. Everything still retired in order because that, that's a must. You have to maintain that. Then you fetch new instruction. When previous instructions stall, you keep fetching, right? And when we put everything together today, and because I have a limit on the, the size of like the things I can put here, right? I'm going to switch back to, if you go to the class website, uh, during the break, feel free to do this. I that's one file there, and say that's a uh, F19 midterm. That's the midterm exam from I think well one two two three two two two, two years ago. This is the third year I'm here. Yeah, two years ago. So there's an out of order question. We'll go through that question together because we we want to. I want to make sure we go through that question together as an example, right? Because on the exam uh, in your midterm, I guarantee you something like that will, will show up. A variation of that question. And that question will show you how each of the structure work. Right? So in super scalar architecture, we keep fetching. And we execute more than one instruction. Why is that the case? I mean, we have more transistor. Why don't we add adders? Why don't we add more fetch unit? We can fetch multiple things at the same time, right? So we can decode multiple things at the same time and we can execute multiple things at the same time. When you have more transistor, you have a choice. What are you gonna use the transistor for? This is one thing you could use the transistor for. Even though you don't add more core, your core can be super powerful a CPU with one fetch unit versus a CPU with four, four Y, four Y mean I can fetch four things at once. Which one is going to be faster? Likely the four Y CPU, right? As long as they are balanced, like if you fetch four things and you have one ALU, that's, that's useless because you're going to fetch things into your instruction windows and it can't go through the pipeline because you have not enough ALU. But if you have four wide fetch unit, multiple decoder and multiple ALUs. Now it means that you can basically, right, basically send multiple things to all the adders and multiplier. And then you can retire multiple things at the same time, right? As long as it maintains a sequential order. And that is one of the reasons why if you compare some chips that say I have two core CPU, well, so it's another chip with eight core CPU. Sometimes the two core can be even faster because the two core is giant. It's like 
a core that can fetch module text. It means that when you run a single thread workload, which will be run on one core, it is likely to be even faster than another setup with eight cores and a weaker GPU, a uh, weaker CPU, right? One example of that is if you look at the A15 chip, they will be saying that there are, it's, it's called Big Little. It's an architecture from ARM. Big Little means I have a big core and small core. What does big core mean? Exactly this. Four wide, eight wide fetch unit, a bunch of decoder, a bunch of ALU, a really fancy branch predictor. I gonna I'm gonna dedicate a lot of transistor into that big core, right? The result of that is that program running on the big core would be really fast. What are those small core? It's much simpler core. It can still be out of order core, but fewer fetch unit, fewer ALUs but it's capable of running multi uh, like multi-threaded program. Why? You just send each thread to each of those small core. If you have single thread program, you can't break them off, so you have to send it to one of the core. So in this case, you might want to send it to the big core, right? So let's say you run two applications on your machine. The one that's single threaded can be run on the big core, while the well, like well-written multi-threaded program can be really fast on the small core. So this is how you can have the, what we call heterogeneity on a chip. You have multiple types of processor, so you can assign the application that works well with one type of processor. Another heterogeneous CPU is the one that has an integrated GPU on chip, right? These days, every chip has an integrated GPU, including the Intel chip, AMD chip, the Apple iPhone chip also has the integrated GPU on, on <clears throat> on the board, right? On the ship. Uh, in that case, tasks that are related to video processing or rendering, right? It might be going through the GPU because it makes more sense, right? So that's how you can take advantage of different types of processor. You can have neural processor as well, so you assign things that run well from them. Now that it goes to super tangential direction, go back, come back, come back to the super scalar architecture. I just need to remind myself to come back to. Whenever I get too excited, I, I tend to keep talking about new technology. Uh, so super scalar, the basis is like, I'm gonna add more component using transistor to make sure your program runs fast, right? And this is still a single threaded program. Uh, a quick note is instruction in this section to execute in any order in your pipeline. As long as you have the reorder buffer at the end, you can maintain the sequential order, right? So the idea of the reorder buffer is basically this. I'm gonna make sure instruction can, can complete internally within the pipeline in any order. So imagine if you have 30 stages pipeline, which is really common, right? This year your CPU is like 30 something stages. So in those 30 stages, any instruction can co go in in any order. We just use full blown data flow. Before we finish, we have the reorder buffer that basically finish up in the write back, in the last stage of your write back, doing things in order. It's like you're cheating, but in a good way, right? You make sure everything is fast and you sort them at the back. And the reorder buffer is a structure that performs that sorting. How do you sort them? When you have new instruction coming in, you already guarantee in order over there, right? So you allocate an entry in the reorder buffer. When you finish, you kick that, that order entry out. So when you do that, you're going to guarantee that it's going to be sorted by the time you fetch, which is the order of your assembly, right? And that's only when the result become visible to the programmer. Basically, the programmer don't see anything that is going on, right? This is likely, so if you haven't taken this class before, right? And, and or any class that talks about out of order execution, this is probably the first time ever that you realize that in your CPU, things, that did, things did not run the same way you expect them to be. Because you want, it, you want your program to be fast. Right? So this is how you can enable that.
The problem with the order buffers in this case, for example, look at how many instances of R3 in there. R3 here, R3 here, R3 here, R3 here, R3 here. R3 here. And you have something that writes R3 back to back. This is R3 version 1. Before this, you have R3 version 0, the original value at R3. Do you have R3 version 2? This is R3 version 3, right? Something weird is going on now in your pipeline. You have write after write. You have write over the other write. So if someone use R3, this has to guarantee that you use R3 version 2, and you have to guarantee you use R3 version 1 here. The problem is when you run things out of order. So let me let me label this. This is A. This is B. This is C. This is D. And this is E. Right. And let's say in your pipeline, you're running things in this order. A, then C, then B, then D, and then E. Right. There's a switch up between C and B. Now, C dispatch. C do what? C modified R3. B needs version 1 of R3, but C create version 2 of R3, which means whatever's in the pipeline is the version 2 already. How do we make sure we still have version 1, right? The problem with our design in the register file is we only have one version of R3. We have no way to maintain multiple versions. How do we fix that? We, we went over this last last week. So what's the name of the technique to fix that? Uh, I think a renaming technique. Exactly. Register renaming, right? We rename R3. So basically R3 version 1, R3 version 2, R3 version 3. So we can use a, 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 another structure to maintain the name, the unique name for R3. And this is called register renaming. And it's done to handle right after read and right after write, which is what you saw earlier, right? You have write after the read command and then write over write itself. Those cause the confusion in the out of order pipeline because it's, even though they're not true dependency, it caused the dependency in the out of order pipeline. To fix that, rather than using the register ID, we rename the register to attack. Imagine tag in a real machine would be just some number, some ID, right? It runs from the zero to the number of ROB entry, right? So let's say you have reorder buffer like 20 entries. The tag will be up to 20. If you have 256 entry, the tag will be from zero to 255. But in, in this lecture, I'm going to label A, B, C, D, and E to make sure it's a little bit easier for me to kind of like say the name, right? So the rest, uh, reorder buffer entry ID becomes that, that name for your register ID. Why is that good? If you go back to this example, right? This example with, with right after read. Every one of these instructions is basically one entry in your reorder buffer. Right? Imagine this. Because every time you fetch a new instruction, you allocate an entry for that instruction. So each instruction got a tab already. Right? So it means that each instruction already have a unique identifier on I'm going to generate this value. I'm going to generate this value. I'm going to generate this value. So it means that R3 version 1 can be achieved by whatever instruction A is generated. R3 version 2 can be get by whatever instruction three, uh, C, my bad, C is doing, right? <clears throat> so then we can rename the register ID with the reorder buffer entry ID. And the actual register, the one that the programmer sees, stays the same, I don't care, right? But if someone used the R3 in your actual register ID, you need to make sure that is not valid. Because if someone in the future want to use it, you can point to the reorder buffer that generate that entry. Right? So now we talk about reorder buffer. We have to then talk about this concept called history buffer because 
what if we can do updates to the register file when exception occurs? So in reorder buffer structure, right, you update the register file entry with the reorder buffer entry. The problem with that is now your register file is speculative. Speculative means I'm looking in the future. Write back doesn't happen yet, but the value in the register file already contain the entry that contains the new data. Basically, you kind of drop the old data, right? So if exception occur, we're screwed because we don't have the old data. So you have to maintain that somehow. The history buffer can be used to, to do that. It store the old value of the destination register. Basically, now instead of store the future value, let's store the old value. So if there's an interrupt, register file still have the the new value, but you have the history buffer to say, hey, here's the old value. So you can use this as the register file state, right? So the difference is, again, in reorder buffer, you update the register file uh, with non-specific value whenever you finish the write back. But if you haven't finished, you have the, the indirection, basically the link between register file entry to reorder buffer entry. History buffer, you update the register file right away with the speculative value. Basically, you don't wait until write back. And you have the history buffer to maintain the old value. You have to lock. The key here is we should use both of them. If we have more transistor, let's use both of them. Why don't we have one copy of a register file, right? Why don't you have a copy of the actual one that the programmer see and the future one? We call this future file. So you have this future file means that I'm going to maintain two copies of the register file. One for the future, the one that's get updated speculative, speculatively. And one of, the, of one of those kind of work as a history buffer is the old register file that the programmer see get updated only at the write back. Right. So the future files again maintain two register file. Whenever we talk about architectural register file, this is what is the register file in the ISA. This is what the programmer see. This is the same old register file that's visible to the programmer. The future register file is the one that we're going to keep aggressively updated with the reorder buffer entry. Right? Like, oh, look at that entry. That entry generated my data. So if you need that data, go look at that entry. Architectural register file, you, uh, sorry. Architectural register file is used only when exception occurs. Because they're like, oh, that's the state of the register file. There you go. Future file is used if it's in the pipeline because that's the most updated version of my data. Go use it. Right. So now you have two copies. Again, trade off, right? More transistor needed for sure because you need to structure, but easier to handle exception, easier to faster to run. Two benefits, right? So again, uh, in this case, state recovery, right? When exception or ha uh, interrupts happen, precise exception can be done through the architecture file. So here's some example. Let's say we have these. Uh, so I'm going to show all the structure all at once, right? Uh, we have four instruction. Add, multiply, add, add, right? And the thing in my parenthesis is just basically explaining what's happening. Add R3, R1, R2, meaning I'm going to add R1 and R2 together, write the result into R3, right? Basically, this get, this get add and write it back here, right? So, uh, sorry, fat finger, not supposed to happen. <clears throat> and let's assume originally your architectural register, no, sorry, has the value of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Again, it's the same copy when you boot up the machine. And let's assume it originally has this value. Right? 
So we will go through the example of how this is done. So then what do we do first? We want to process which instruction? Add R3, uh, R1. Add R3, R1, R2, right? So what do we do here? Uh, we say, hey, the tag is A. I'll just name the tag. It's, it can be the, just the ID of the entry, right? Just tied to this instruction. Is it valid? Not yet. I'm adding them, right? What's the value? R3. Don't know yet, right? I'll just say X. X means I don't know. Uh, let you, I, let me in case I use a variable name X letter. I'll, I'll just say not available, right? And and slash A. Uh, what is source one? One, a two. Uh, a one, right? What is a one? Yes. You look at the future file, right? And a one is one, so source one is one. A two, you look at the future file is two, so source two is two. Now, what do you write the result to? R3, right? So where do we update R3? Future file. In the future file. In the architectural register file, we don't do anything yet. In the future file, we get rid of the old R3, and then now R3 points to what? R3. A, because we don't have the valid value yet. So we say, hey, if anyone use R3, go look at that entry. Right? So anything that comes after this instruction will look at R3 by looking at it. Then you fetch the multiply, right? Multiply, well, let's just say the tag is B, right? It's not valid yet because I'm fetching, not available as well. We want R3 and R4. What is R4? Source 2 is easier. You look at R4 right here, so it's 4. How about R3? A. It's A. A, right? You look at R3 in the future file, and, and you're like, oh, okay, A. If exception happen at instruction B, what do you do? You say, the architectural register file, that's what we get. It and then make sure because exception happen happen right here. Make sure this thing finish, which means this thing will update R three here in a new map. So when exception happen, you're gonna mark this entry that hey that thing is causing an exception. You're gonna keep retiring this and update the architectural register file. So I'm gonna go to. I, I'm going to continue on. Let's assume exception does not happen, right? And I'll see what happened to the architecture of register file. Okay. So let's say the next instruction comes in. Nothing finished yet. C comes in. Okay. Not valid, not available. I'm still running. R6 is 6, R7 is 7, right? I'm going to write the result on to R3 again. Oh, by the way, I forgot. R5, I need to update R5. Why do you have to update R5? Because of this. Because of the second modifier. Because the first modifier that happens. So the R5 will be here, right? I'm going to update it with B. And then in the third instruction, again, I'm updating R3. I'm updating R3. So I can replace R3 entry here with. <laughs> Right, and let's say a finish. Let's say a finish. This become valid. The value is three. What do we do here? Uh, replace a with b in all the instructions. Yeah, basically, I'm gonna make sure there's a wire go across your CPU and say whoever need this ID update your entry, please. With this new vector. So you can now replace A with three. With three, right? But we let's 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 do one more thing. Let's say this has not finished. Right? Okay, 
is still like this. What will happen here is this thing can go while this thing is waiting for it. You see, out of order execution now because you can dispatch instruction C ahead of instruction D. Right? But let's say this is finished. I'm just gonna basically update this, update this, and update this. Right? Value, value is 3, A, and this 3 again, the same, same value. Right? Over here, you probably, I forgot, you have to have the register ID there for the, the destination. Right? Why do we need this? It's basically so that you can update this guy, right? Because otherwise R three is gone. You don't know what the register ID A is trying to update, right? So in that case, you still need to maintain that. It's like, oh, that that's R three. So whenever I finish, I'm gonna update R three in the architecture register file. So D comes in. Not available again, right? It needs R three and R two. So right now R three is C, and R two is Q. So update R three again with D, because D also wants to write into R three. Okay, so that's the future file, and as you can see here, you have the 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 the, the simplicity, the simplicity of the architecture file, for so an exception occurs. You can just be hired up to the, the exception for causing instruction. It's going to access your register, register file, which is get updated whenever you finish your right? And then you can aggressively run because you have the future file. So, what's the overhead? Can someone tell me what's the downside of this? What, what what's What's the downside compared to reorder buffer? Well, obviously, you need to maintain two copy of the register file, right? That can be costly, actually. So, what could be your solution? Use the direction, right? You just have one single storage. Basically, from the high-level point of view, abstract, in the abstract sense, you still have two separate register files, right? But, I mean, you can kind of combine both of them, right? What, the, the, and there'll be one entry to be the architectural value, and the other entry is like the future file. And you can use this structure to map the future for each for each unit in the ALU for each unit in the ALU you kind of combine that table that I showed earlier with the value so the future the future value is map and use in this way and this structure is called register aliasing table and this replaced the future file which register aliasing table as the name suggests alias is like a, a new name right so this kind of replaced the the architectural uh, future file and you have the architectural map that is used for state so here's how it works have register aliasing table here. Your register file is the aggressive one, the speculative one. Register file is the speculative one. Right? You still maintain these values. Half A, B, C, and D for instruction, right? Initially, this is not valid again. Not available. Source one is one. Source two is two, right? <clears throat> and this is your register aliasing table. It's one per ALU. So is this a correct way to represent whatever I'm gonna put in in this table? Focusing on this. Actually, it's not because I have add and multiply, right? So B should not be here. Yes. 
Oh, and you have to multiply. This is where the table, which contains the not valid, right? Not available. Source one is A, source two is four. I'm writing to, and then you have to add register ID. In this case, what's the register ID of destination? Three. What's the register ID of my destination? For multiply. Five, right? Five. And then you have C here, not valid. You want six and seven. You have D here, not valid, right? That doesn't have value yet. It use R three in this case. R three is C. And you're gonna have to update the future file as well. So initially, R three is A. Right. And then it gets replaced because another guy write to R3, so that's replaced to C and it gets replaced to D. R5 will get replaced to B. So in this case, your register file is the feature version of it. But if you want, right, if you want to maintain precise exception, you have the indirection that maps back because you have this register ID. That say, hey, if exception happened right here, right? If exception happened right there, retires whatever is in front of me. For all for all register ID there, that's the true value that you're gonna return. So that's your state. It already means in the state for you. So why having two copies of your register and kind of combine them and save the entry? Then last thing we can do is called checkpointing, right? Checkpointing the key concept is when you have branches and you have branches, whatever is done in your register pipeline and reorder buffer and all the IAT and register aliasing table is speculative based on the branch outcome, which means your future file is broken. It's going to be broken for sure if, if, you mispredict your branch because you don't have the old state anymore. You replace that, right? So in this case, you can create a copy of the future file associated with the branch because by the time you know the outcome, you can revert back to that version. You can revert the future file back to that version. Uh, think of this as like when you play a game right before you fight a boss you have to save your game, right? In this case, you save the future file and you mark the entry in the register aliasing table to say, hey, that's a branch. That's when the, that's before the branch happened and this is after the branch happened. So you know what to revert back to essentially. When branch misprediction occur, you restore the future file. You restore the future file. And you throw away anything in the register aliasing table that is the, the, the mispredicted branch and you're done. Right? You don't even need another copy of the IAT because you can throw it away and you're done. Because you know already this is before branch, this is after the branch. So you throw everything from here out. Right? So now we have all the component to perform our uh, hopefully friendly friends uh, out of order execution. Again, back to the concept of dynamic instruction schedule. Actually, now that it's about an hour in, I think let's take a break. Uh, let's do a 10 minutes break before we transition into out of order execution, which is like, let's wrap everything together. Feel free to start downloading the, uh, the exam uh, worksheet. There's an out of order question right there. Feel free to try and um, at least read the bullet points and assumption, but we will go through them once we come back. Right? I will use that as an example of how this works. Uh, we go through them once we are back. In it, in in any case, if you want to kind of pre-download this, you can go to the class website beforehand. We'll uh, we'll meet again at ten or two. Right? So, uh. 
I will go get some water. I'll be right back. And if you have any question, feel free to type it in on the chat. <clears throat> if I'm not here, once, if I'm back here, uh, but we are still taking a break, like in the middle, let's say it's 10.08, 10.09, uh, feel free to just turn on the microphone and ask. I'm going to enable my video uh, to, to, to so that you can see whether I'm back or not. I'm going to go stretch a little bit. My back has been hurting. <laughs> All right, I'll be right back.
Uh, Muhammad, can you uh, download the uh, F19 com admin term? It's uh, okay. unpublished now, right? Uh, no, I think it is not accessible. We will ask the professor. Okay. Any questions uh, in the meantime while we are uh, finishing up the first break? Uh, yes, the file is not uh, uh, loading. It says the file is part of an unpublished module. Uh, and it's not oh, published. it's not. Hmm. I think I, I was trying to check yesterday to make sure it's published, but let me double check again. Yeah, it's already published. It's called uh, f 19 com arc midterm not PDF. Let me let me put that in an announcement so that you have a link to the correct file just in case. Okay, I just make an announcement. I think you should be, uh, hopefully, uh, able to download it. Uh, when we open the PDF, it shows uh, that uh, this is not available. You can see the error in the chat box. A part has popped in there. Okay, let me check. Huh. There might be some inconsistency then. Let me go to modules. Can I try again? It should. I think we should be up now. I found. I found the. Does it work? Yes. Okay. okay, cool. So let's uh, resume. So now let's wrap up what we learned so far and put it together in the form of auto order execution, right? Uh, this is done through, again, dynamic instruction scheduling. What we assume so far is software schedule all the instruction through the assembly. Right? Line by line by line by line. Instruction is coming into your pipeline in order. Right now, hardware will execute instruction in order, right? So your question is, why can't we just dispatch independent instruction? You've seen some of that already, right? So let's put this all together into an algorithm that you can follow. And it would help in order to kind of figure out how can you dispatch and how can you update, right? So the idea is not just retiring in order and execute out of order. We do this way earlier in the decode. Whenever we have to dispatch my instruction, we can dispatch out of order. 
Okay. Move dependent instruction out of the way. How to do that? We will issue whenever we have the source operand ready. Right. The benefit here is it's going to be faster. Right. Why is this faster? Because this basically imitates data flow. Whenever I have the data, I'm going to start running it right away. It means that I will finish hopefully everything faster. It can correlate the latency of instruction that take a while to finish. Let's say I load and install block your block your path, right? Out of, out of order dispatch will allow you to cut the queue. Imagine if you go to like a, a huge uh, uh, supermarket, right? And the guy in front of your checkout line is buying so many things, right? They will take some time to check out. What if there's another line that allows you to cut through and dispatch? Because there's a check uh, check check outline empty that you can use, but you would go cut the line and go to those lines. So here's a key component. You need this thing called reservation station. This is basically instruction window that I mentioned earlier. So in the code, we keep fetching this thing in the reservation station. As the name suggests, it reserve. It's a station that reserve your instruction information, right? If the operand become ready, you dispatch them. So you check, you keep checking your window, right? And see, hey, anything ready, anything ready, anything ready, anything ready. If they are ready, dispatch. This is called scheduling window. Reservation station, instruction windows, kind of interchangeable. And then you add a structure to help the reordering at the end, which can be the reorder buffer or the future file with the register aliasing table, right? This is done to make sure that instruction are still committed in order. Basically, it should finish in order. Dispatch out of order, finish in order, right? And this, the structure to help reordering is called instruction window. So there's a scheduling window and instruction window. Instruction window maintain the order of things. Scheduling windows basically refer to when you dispatch. Anything else? RIT, right? RIT to make sure it's, it's, it can maintain the updated version of your register. So here's the what goes into the reservation station. When you fetch an instruction, you put that instruction, you keep fetching, even though the pipeline is stalling, you're going to aggressively fetch right, into your res reservation station. And the station would maintain every single active instruction. Right? This is different from instruction window. This is the active instruction that you fetch and seek the operand and operation. And when all the operand are ready, you dispatch. When all the operand are ready, you dispatch. And to deal with register renaming, as we discussed earlier, just rename with the ID, but not on the reorder buffer entry ID. This is now on the reservation station entry. Because the reservation station now have the have the most active version of your instruction, you actively try to dispatch. Right? So register ID would use the reservation station app uh, reservation station entry. Then the architectural register ID is the physical register, which is R0, R1, R2. So the architectural register, as the name suggests, this is what the program will see. So you, so you should still make sure it's the same name. R0, R1, R2, R3, don't replace that. Then inside the register aliasing table, it becomes just a renamed table. It has a tab. It has the value, if there are, and the valid bit. If the tag would be the, the name that you're renaming it with. The value is what goes into the value. If I have this name as done, the value should be updated and it's valid. If it's not done, it's not valid and it has this certain values. 
this would get rid of right after read and right after write as, as we discussed earlier. And it virtually allow you to en enabling the performance of having lost and lost and lost of register. This is through register re renaming. This is through register re renaming. And again, here's the quick example of the overview of reservation station. So instruction can be something like add, right? And 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 because I don't have the room, fill in the rest like add R one, R two, and R three, right? This can be just a binary because instruction at the end of the day is binary, right? Destination it be it can be a source one is X, source two is two, for example. It means that I'm gonna add whatever is done to X, right? In this case, because it's the first entry, let me not use X, let me use a number, because the, most of the time, the first entry, the oldest instruction, they have everything. But let's say you have a multiply, right? Destination B, source can be, in this case, A, which would be forward from this guy. You can multiply the same, the same register value, again, forward from A, so on and so forth, right? And this, uh, destination is basically can be R0 or an R1, right? And here is the algorithm. If the reservation station is available before register renaming, if reservation station is available, basically we have entries we can feed instruction in. What does it mean? It means we can keep fetching. Because we're going to keep fetching until this reservation station is full. We're going to keep fetching until the reservation station is full. So if instruction and uh, if reservation station have an entry, you insert, you fetch, basically you fetch and insert that instruction into the reservation station. The source and the tag like A and B, right? the source, which can be the actual value or the tag A, B, C, D, if the value is not available, would be insert to the reservation station. If you insert, then you do renaming, essentially. You insert the entry in, if you need R0, R1, and R2, you go look it up. If it's available, awesome, put a number in. If it's not available, put the ID in and wait. If the number get put in and everything becomes available, dispatch. If the reservation is not, uh, the station is not available, it means the, the whole thing is full. The whole thing is full means we cannot fetch anymore. That's actually the only time when your processor actually stall. You stall the fetch. The rest, if you have entries in the reservation station, you can keep fetching and you can keep dispatching. Right? So you, you reduce the chance of putting the bubble in your pipeline because you're going to keep fetching. The bigger the reservation station is, it means that there's the more chance that I can keep fetching. Right? This is how you can keep the CPU active. Inside the station, Inside the session, this is what happened. This is what happened. Every instruction would watch. There's a common data bus, so we're going to go into more the hardware design, right? How does each of these structure communicate? Because at the end of the day, when things are done, you need to update the value. To do that, you have a bus. What is a bus? And anyone here, are, are both of you familiar with the concept of a bus? Think of it as a wire. It connects components. Right, and the reason why we call it a bus is what? What does a bus do in in real world? It moves people, right? Move box of people. In this case, a bus a, a bus would move the data, and because that's only one bus, it means that you have to basically figure out okay, where is the bus? Who is using it? So in this case, there's a common data bus that would basically declare, here's the tag, here's the tag, here's the tag. Every single entry in your station would watch for that. It would watch for the tag. 
the task is A, B, C, D, and E. Basically, whenever an instruction finish, whenever an instruction finish, it will announce A is done. Whoever needs A, here's a tag. And then the reservation station would go and say, hey, I need A in my source, in source one. The other instruction say, hey, I need A in source two. So in that case, if the tag is available, you take the source value because now the value is available, right? And you keep, you update the reserva reservation station entry, right? For example, over here, if the entry is A, right? And then this one, this guy is done, it means that it will announce the value of A. So in that case, right, in that case, you update this to the actual value. So let's say this is adding one and two, so you could replace A with three. Right. So that's how you update. So you watch for the tag. When the tag is available, it means that that common data bus is announcing the value. You take that value, update the value in the table, then go back again. If in this case, source one and source two because a becomes ready i have both source one and source two what does it mean i know what is source one is three but source two is three it means i can dispatch right? because i have both the operand so in that case if both source operand are available now you can dispatch so you dispatch to the functional unit. Basically, you send this to the functional unit. If the functional unit is full, right? If the functional unit is full, you can't put that in. But, but you can kind of dispatch and queue up because you have what? Each functional unit has its own register aliasing table. So you're going to add this into the register aliasing table and say, hey, this is the next instruction. These are the source, these are the opera, and go run it. How the instruction finish from the functional unit? Again, because you're done, you broadcast the tag and the value. Say, hey, who else need B? So that everyone can update. Whenever someone needs B, you can update. You can write the value into, for example, register that contain the tag, right? You write the value into the match tag and see if the valid bit is zero, now it becomes valid. So you set the valid bit. Whenever I say set a, a sum bit, set sum bit means I'm going to change from zero to one. Reset a bit means I'm going to change it back to zero. Then you reclaim the rename tag. Basically, sometimes you run out of tag, so you reclaim that. So that's the algorithm side. Put everything together using our example. So let me open up that file. I need to change the screen because I forgot that if I'm, I'm going to write something to my screen, I need to use my, my laptop screen rather than my monitor screen. So give me one second to do this.
let's set up a uh, weirdness here. So let me stop sharing the screen and share this one. Nope, not that one. Stop sharing. I need this first screen here. Do you see the screen with the PDF that I'm basically going up and down? Okay, perfect. All right, so let's go through this together. Uh, should I give you some time to read at least the bullet points at, at the top? Here. So I'm going to give you some time to download the PDF and check this out. Check this part out. I'll give you five minutes. All right. So let's, let's do this. Uh, let's do five minutes just so that everyone of both of you uh, know what are the assumptions we have with the question. Uh, I'll be right back at uh, 10.35, basically four minutes to read this. All right.
let's uh, let's go through this together. So first of all, uh, you you see that this is done using Kamasula style, right? What the algorithm I just explained earlier is called Tamasolo algorithm. This is like one of the most important algorithms in hardware design. It kind of dictates how other order scheduling work. Okay. Uh, there's going to be a review for this paper, actually. Uh, so feel free to check it out. It has register aliasing table and reservation station, right? <clears throat> and you have out of order machine. The first keyword here is processor is fully pipeline. It basically means that everything, every state here is fully pipeline. It, it basically the add, the modify are also pipeline. The fed is pipeline. Decode is pipeline. Write back is pipeline. There's no weird stalling and say hey add use three cycle is pipeline so the three cycle within the ad is also pipeline all, all the instruction fetch take one cycle decode take one cycle write back take one cycle it has an adder and multiplier add five add instruction take three cycle multiply instruction take four cycle Each adder and multiplier has a separate common data buses. What does this give you? It has two buses, so it means within that one cycle, if the add and multiply happen to finish at the same time, they can broadcast that result together, right? One is the bus for the adder, the other one is the bus for the multiplier. Basically, I, I say that next, right? Allow both adder and multiplier to broadcast the result in the same cycle. Instruction always allocate the first reservation station that is available in the top to bottom order. This is basically kind of like for us to grade. So we can see the same format. Otherwise, you're going to do like weird things with your table. And suppose the pipeline initially is empty and the machine fits exactly five instruction, which uh whatever you see here, right? So let me first label the instruction. Instruction A, instruction B, instruction C, instruction D, and instruction D. So the first task is simple, right? The first task is simple. What are these instructions? So what's the first one? Add, right? What do you add to? Someone tell me what do you need for destination, source one, and source two? Right. Destination will be R1 and source will be R5 and R6. This is R5, R6. And this is going to write to R1, right? Because R1 is right here. The next instruction is what? A multiply. multiply. What is the source one for the first multiply? R1. Uh... R1. And source two is R6. You write it to R2, right? Then you have another multiply. Okay. You put in source one is R1 and R2, right? And then the destination is what? R4. Then this, this is when things get a little bit interesting. You have an add, right? You add R2 to R5, and you write the result into R4, and then you do a multiply. You multiply what? You multiply R4 and R4, you write the result into R4. Right? You can do it. Then you see the next page. Yes. Okay. 
Uh, let me, do you mind if I keep another copy on my other screen so that I can see the, the instruction? Sorry. Just to make sure I can see this. Okay, so let's do this together, right? In the first cycle, in the first cycle, what happened? The first instruction you have is add, basically, let me, let me rewrite it here. Uh, add. R1, R6, R4, R2, R1, and then you have another add, and another particle, right? This is going to be R4, R5, and R2, R4, R4, and R4. So that's our instruction we have earlier. Right? So the first thing we do is, let's go, Initially, right, initially, because I forgot to put in the initial value for for what goes into the register file. So let's say initially R zero take the value R zero. Whenever I write R zero, that's the initial value R zero. So if I say R n, it means the value of R n. All right. So here are two, uh, I guess, three tables. The register aliasing table and the reservation station for for both add. I'm gonna scroll down to here, right? For both add and multiply. The first first thing we do is we can say, hey, the tag initially is R zero, R one, R two, R three, R four, R five, R six. And R7, everything is valid. R0, R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, R6, R7, and my cat is sneaking on me. So let me change the color so that whatever, whenever we start doing things going forward, I'm going to use the color orange for now. Right. So the first thing I would do is, what's the first instruction? Add, I add R1 to R5 and R6. So the way I do this is I go to the reservation station for the add, right? What is the source for my add? Source 1. R5. R5. Is that valid? To figure out whether it's valid or not, you first look at register aliasing table. You see a valid bit. Right? So it means I can put in R5, which has a value R5, and it's valid. Then the second source is R6. So 1, R6, and R6, because right now R6 is valid. So that's the first, like, we're done with the first cycle. Right now, we're done with the first cycle. We fetch instruction. The reason, another reason why I use this PDF is because it has this cycle at the bottom as well, so I can kind of trace through each cycle what happens. I fetch and I decode. Right? This is actually the second cycle, to be honest. This is done in decode. Fetch. You fetch that into the reservation station, you decode this. And then you fetch instruction number two. What is instruction number two? Multiply. Okay. So when you finish the fetch, you start to execute the first add. You decode, right? You decode the output. What is the score for R1 and R6? Oh, actually, I forgot one more thing. When you are 
encoding the first add, you write it back to R1. So for your register aliasing table, R1 has to be replaced, right? With what? <coughs> What do I place R1 with? R1 becomes the definition of the ad, right? Which entry has the ad? A. So you put not valid because I'm still adding. The value is not available yet. All right. So this is basically how you update each time. Now you're doing just the multiply. What's the first source of the multiply? Uh, R1. R1. So you go look at R1. Is that valid? No. What's the tag? A. A. What's the value? I mean, actually, I don't care because it's not valid. Okay. What's the second source? R6, you go to R6, that's valid. The tag is R6, the value is R6. Do we so far? Oh, yes. All right, so how many cycle is an add? Mm. Is take, add take three cycle, multiply take four, right? So you're still executing. Equal, can I, can I execute here? Go to second multiply. Uh, and no. no, so you have to wait, right? I can fetch here because I have my my reservation station is not full, so I can fetch this into my instruction window. The decode can actually work on it and say, hey, it's a multiply. So I'm going to put the second multiply in. It needs R2 and R1, right? So R2, is that valid or not valid? No, really. It's valid. The tag is R2. Value is R2. How about the second source? That's R1. R1 is not valid yet, right? So that's A. And not available. I also forgot again. Actually, I forgot. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I'm sorry, guys. Let me delete this. When I'm processing this multiply, this multiply, are you with me? So it's the, the first multiply. It's writing to R2, so I need to update R2 right here, right? R2 what is R2 is not valid. The tag is what? What is it? Tag is it is this it is multiplied. This is what I forgot. So the tag is X. The value is not available. Basically, I'm multiplying R1 and R6, writing it in R2. So that's instruction number two. That's what I forgot. So let's go to instruction three. Instruction three takes R2 and R1. Is R2 available? No. No. So it's not valid. The tag of R2 is X. No value yet. Not valid. The tag is A. No value yet. Okay. So that's the third instruction. That's the third. I fetch the fourth instruction. I kind of like doing the last, the last stage of the ad. I don't have anything here yet. Instruction two still cannot be dispatched. I'm waiting for A. Instruction three also cannot be dispatched. I'm waiting for both X and A. But I can decode instruction four. Instruction four is an ad to R4. And instruction three modify R4. So you need to update here. Right. What does instruction 3 do to R4? Not valid again, right? What's the tag for instruction uh, that, that generated by instruction 4? I mean, instruction 3. Or R4. What's the tag? Y, right? This is instruction 3. This is Y. This is X. This is A. So instruction three, because you write to R4, 
this become y and this is not available. Are you with me so far? Yes. Then for instruction number four, the add, I'm going to add R5 and R2. What is R5? Is it valid? Oh, uh, yes. Because it's an add, I'm going to put it here. It's valid. R5, the value is R5. What about R2? Uh, not valid. Not valid. So I'm going to put not valid. What's the tag? X, right? And again, this is not available. What does instruction four modify? It modifies R4, right? It modifies R4. So what do we do here? To replace R4 in here again with a new tag. Not available. What is the new tag here? okay why is it okay to just replace the old one x i mean not x y i mean by that why is it okay for me to replace y with b because my reservation station already maintained that hey whenever y is done i'm gonna broadcast so whoever has Y on that table, you will get your value whenever that station entries is done. Right. So then I can fetch here. Because there's no memory stage. So this skip directly to write back. Do I have something from my app? from instruction one. Instruction one is done, right? It's finished the execute stage. So this common data bus for the adder say, hey, whoever need A, replace A with R5 plus R6. It's broadcasting. So this is what will happen. Erase, right? There's A right here. There's A right here. Do I miss anything? Just in case I miss it. I don't think. Right. So now A becomes valid. What's the value of A? Well, tag, right? right. The value is R5 plus R6. Again, here, valid tag is R1, R5 plus R6. Valid. R1, R5, plus R6. Because I now know A. Then can I dispatch anything? This instruction finish. Anything becomes ready that I can dispatch? Let's check the valid bit. If both of them are one, it means I can dispatch, right? So anything here that I have not dispatched that I can dispatch now. This guy, right? It recently become valid and the multiplier is not doing anything, so I can start executing this. Can I execute any anything else in my reservation station? No, because I'm waiting for X. I am waiting for X. So I can't do anything here. I can't do anything here. I'm going to decode the last instruction, which is the last multiply. So I'm going to allocate an entry over here. Not valid for both of them. What is R4? You go look at R4, right? This is B. Not available. B. You're done in cycle number seven for instruction one, right? You finish the write back. When you finish the write back, what do you do? You update the register file. So, what do you think? File in the way 
here you then update the the, the quest instruction update with a five plus R6, right? I, I don't put that architecture of register file here because we have no space to do so. The register aliasing table already have the future version of it, and you have the register file to to do the recovery, right? Then, then what we have here? Keep executing the multiply. I can't do anything here for the rest of it. It's still waiting for all that dependency. Execute the multiply for two more cycles because nothing is done here. I'm still waiting for that uh, execute state, right? So then at the end, at the end of cycle number nine, instruction two is in the last stage of the execute, right? It's in the last stage of the execute. What it means is instruction two, which is X, which is X, in the next cycle, in the next cycle, it becomes available because at cycle 10, at cycle 10 right here, you broadcast X. So you write back here, in cycle number 10, you broadcast X. Whoever has X, replace that with, well, let me go through this. Broadcast X. This guy. Wow. So it becomes available. This R2. And what is X? X is, I guess, R6 multiplied by R5 plus uh, 4. That's a lot of things. Right? So let, let's say, let's say X equal, let's say the value of X equal, I don't know, Give me some number. 100. Let's say it's equal 100. Right? So you put in the value. 100. Right? So in this case, how many instructions become ready? Which one becomes ready? So we are done with A. We are done with X. In the reservation station, anything that you can dispatch. Uh, B and Y. B and Y, right? So you can execute both B and Y. Yes. You see, you can do two things at once now. Because you have two, one adder, one amount of wire. You just send them both, right? Then what do we do next? We just keep going, right? This is the multiply, so if we keep multiplying, this is the adder, we keep adding, and then you're done with the adder right here. You're done with the adder at cycle number 13. At cycle number 13, this common data bus is done with B. So say, hey, B, whoever need B, that value is 100 plus R5. So you go and replace B, which is out here. This is the tricky part. Because B is R4 is not valid. I forgot to update. This actually should be C. Because the last modify modify R4 again. And the last modify tag is C. I forgot to update that. So that should be C. This thing becomes all available, right? This is R4. This is 100 plus R5. Again, one. Uh, four, one hundred plus five, one. Okay. Sorry, this one this is not here. There are two adds and three multiply. Somehow I add one more add instruction. So I have C, so I can dispatch, right? I can now dispatch the last multiply. Because multiply is fully pipeline, 
even though instruction number three is finishing up their multiply, the multiplier is also fully pipeline means it has four stages within the multiplier. So I can do execute one for the last multiply. Right back right here at cycle number 14. Now you broadcast not X, but Y and say Y is going to be whatever value that is. Right? So you go and look who needs Y. Anyone here need Y? Yeah, no, no. Because why is that the case? Because C replaced Y right away. C replaced Y already. Because it's R4, right? It's R4. Y is this guy. Instruction B already replaced Y. And then instruction C replaced Y again. Okay. So basically now you finish the last instruction to multiply, and then you write back, it finished at cycle number 17. And then you did broadcast C. And that's all. Any questions from this example before we transition back to our slides? So one thing I would like to ask of you, because now you have the copy of the midterm, right? Please go through them so that next week, if you have questions, we can do a Q&A. There'll be some period of time that I, I can do a Q&A uh, for next week before I need to head off uh, around like 1.15, 1.20, uh, 11.15 or 11.20, depending on when, when are they going to call me uh, for an interview. Uh, I, I will encourage you to go through the sample questions and try to work on it, right? I'm not going to pause the answer because I will try to force you to do it before next week so you can ask me in class, all right? So we'll use the sample midterm as a guide on the review. So I'm going to post a bunch of topics, right, on the slide. I'll talk about how the CPU handle load and store, and then you kind of wrap it up with a Q and A at the end. All right. So this is almost like basically wrapping up the out of order execution. So let me uncheck the screen and. Like, let's continue the discussion. What's the benefit of out of order execution? As we discussed already, this imitate the data flow model, right? This basically gives you the imitation of data flow. The ALU would fire off the operation whenever I have the data ready. And the ISA is still one Neumann, which means that this is easy to program. This is what we call a restricted data flow machine. So when you put the word restricted, what do I mean? What is restrictive about this out of order execution? When can I stall? When do I have to stall? When do I have to stop fetching? Remember our reservation station, right? Reservation station. You can keep putting things in there until what? Until it becomes full. Until it becomes full, right? So that limit, 
that limits how many you can fetch. So if there are independent instruction in the future and you fail to put that in the reservation station, you are not going to get the benefit of data flow. So the number of entries in the reservation station uh, di dictates how aggressive you can fetch. And there are certain limitations with that because it's a hardware component, we can't add unlimited number of that. Right, so there are kind of like other techniques to make sure that your processor is fast. So what dictate the speed of how much I can clear out the reservation station? So my second question is, if I know that reservation station, whenever reservation station is full, I cannot put things in. It means that I want to get rid of the entry in the reservation station as soon as possible, right? I want to be as fast as possible. So what can I do? Pipeline the adder, pipeline the multiplier, add more adders, add more multipliers. What else? What instruction are slow in your, in your, in your processor? So we are talking about compute, right? We are talking about load and store, and we are also talking about branches. What type of instruction are typically a lot slower? Multiply. Multiply is a lot slower. Okay, so sometimes you might want to add like a an optimization on the multiply. I mean, look at your program. How many have you had to multiply two numbers together? A lot, right? Another thing is memory. Another thing is memory because we 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 basically now didn't talk about memory at all, right? It's not in the picture yet. It's actually taking way more time than a multiply, right? Going to the memory take, uh, if you read processor spec sheet, right? Even with the lowest level cache, it takes four cycle. So going to the main memory, it takes at minimum, if it hit in the last level, uh, in the first level of the cache, it will take four cycle. In some cases, it, it missed, so it goes to the second level cache. So we'll talk about that after the midterm. Don't worry about that. The range of the how much a load can take or a store can take can be four cycle to more than 200 cycle. It can be that bad, right? Imagine you have one or two load instruction that generate, right? So let's say you have a load instruction that generate value for R0 and R1 right now. Basically, my load instruction is basically going to replace R0 and R1 with its value. It becomes, it the right now, R0 and R1 are not valid. It's waiting for this load, right? It means that there's a chance that in the next 200 cycle, no one can use R0, no one can use R1. It's not going to become ready. So it means that any future instruction that are dependent on this value is going to be blocked, right? There's already a, a few paper that make a case that, hey, the windows, the instruction windows that you can have, when you expand from 256 entry to 512 entry, your benefit plateau because at some point you have these load instructions that block everything. Everything becomes dependent on those two or three loads, right? So it might be another good idea to make those load faster, right? So we'll talk about that uh, through where the next half of the course. Right now we talk, uh, let's kind of like wrap it up. Like, hey, what, what to do when you have out of order execution and memory, right? Because the content in your main memory has to be outdated. Again, in the program order, right? You go to the main memory, you have load, you have store. Those also have to be in the program order. But that's the dependency of the load instruction that are not known until our previous store finished. This, let, let, me, let me first give you an example. I want to store the value of R0 to address 0x20. So I go to address 20, I want to store whatever value of R0 is, store at 20. Then I have a load instruction, right? That I want to load address 20. 
into R1. I mean, essentially, this is basically copying the value of R0 into R1, right? But in the meantime, you also update address 20. There's a dependency here again. You have a load instruction. And there's a previous store in line is being stored, right? The key here is, first of all, how can you detect the dependency? One way you can do this, wait until the store finish, right? Whenever R0, basically in this case, R0 is written to address 20, and I'm waiting for, say, 200 cycle, and that's done. Then I see the load instruction, right? And I say, hey, okay, address 20 is ready. I start loading. And that take another 200 cycle to put the value into R1. So I can do that. I can wait until the store finish, then I start the load. Right? How many cycles will that take? Two hundred plus two hundred, right? Two hundred plus two hundred. But when I see this load, when I see this load, forget about the computer. If you look at this load, what's the value of R one? What should I load into R one? Zero. Uh, I feel right. You see the code like store and then load next line is a load and you know oh okay the same address so i guess r1 equal r0 right if i am a magician i can somehow instead of waiting 400 cycle i can just say hey i want take r0 that's all everything done inside your processor right so we're gonna talk about how we can do this out of order execution but with the memory how do we do this? All the pending store, again, we have a buffer, but now it's not the buffer for the compute instruction. We, we, we name this thing a load queue and a store queue. So the store queue, whenever you have a new store, you put that in the store queue. Right? And you store what? You store the ID of that register. Say, hey, I'm going to have to store this value from this register to this address. So you store the value and you store the address. You have the address now. Whenever you have the load to that same address inside the load queue, you go search your store queue. Like, anyone trying to store to that address? If there is, get me that value. Mm -hmm. Get me that value. So whenever you have a load instruction, right, we can redirect again using the redirection. Say, hey, that entry is going to go basically storing data to my load. So that means you can forward the data from a store queue to the load. So modern processor will employ this. It employs the load and store queue. So the obvious part is the load to search the store queue after it knows the load address. <coughs> so whenever you know the address, sometimes it takes a few cycles to figure out what's my address that I want to load. But once you know the address, you check the store queue and see if anyone is trying to store that at a value to that address. If yes, if that's a yes, forward it. You don't have to go to the main memory because your CPU inside the store queue has your value. This obvious part is whenever I have a store queue, right, and I have a new store coming in, because it's an out of order, because these are out of order. Sometimes when you store things on the queue, there are future loads, but already in a load queue because you do things out of order. So future load can be in the queue waiting for that address. Okay, because the instruction is dispatched out of order. So let's say this is the correct order of things. This is like in order. Store. 
But in reality, in out of order processor, let's say it's store B, this thing takes a while to figure out, okay, what's B, what's my address? And to load B is, I know right away, I want to load address 20. So load B get dispatched first. This is a dispatch order. Load B followed by store B. But if you look at this, with this dispatch order, when you have store B in a store queue, you know that load B needs it, right? Load B needs it. So in this case, you need to make sure when you put new things in your store queue, you update the load queue on whoever needs this address, that uh, the instruction that is future, in the future of myself, feel free to take this step. Another thing is most processors will combine a load star queue in order to have like more uh, more space efficient structure. It will be one single structure. Next week we'll expand onto this concept in the beginning of the class, probably around like 30 minutes to one hour before we do a review. Right? When we do a review, it's basically one more hour going through all everything, including a uh, sample exam, if you have any questions. So I do encourage you to at least take a look at the sample midterm so that you can come with question, right? Otherwise that one hour you will be done early. <laughs> uh, so you will spend maybe one hour on the stock queue and that's it. That's basically kind of wrap up what goes into your processor and the pipeline, right? That wrap up how to make a fast CPU. We haven't talked about how to make a fast memory yet, so that's one stage in your pipeline. It's a really big stage in the memory stage that you have to take care of. And to be honest, the fetch stage, because fetch, where do you fetch the, the, the instruction from? From the memory. From the main memory, right? So both the fetch and the memory has something to do with the main memory. So we need to make sure the memory is fast. We'll kind of transition into how to make the memory fast. Before we leave today, uh, how how this big paper? How, I guess, let me rephrase the question. I kind of want to kind of gauge uh, where things are. How's paper reading so far? Are you finding it interesting? Are you finding it a little bit too old <laughs> uh, for the paper or how, how, how are things so far? Uh, well, yes, uh, but uh, my review is the paper. Uh, the, the paper review is actually a very good idea because now we are used to read paper, difficult papers, and now it takes a less time because uh, the habit is being developed to read papers. And yes, it. Uh, but I say it's kind of interesting to uh, read the papers and then discuss the that in the class as well. So yes. Uh, the, this week's paper is also about the superscalar architectures. Uh, mm -hmm. that and uh, yes, we discussed that. Yeah. Should I? So, uh, uh, so I think, so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of like for this week, I'll tone down the discussion because of the type of the paper you guys are reading right now, which is a superscalar architecture, right? One thing I can tell you is that paper is a really, really good engineering paper. Right? Yeah. It kind of gives you a lot of ideas that we kind of described already. Right? So that so that's oh, why yeah. I want to tone down this week's paper because we we already talk about it to some extent, including the out of order processor and out of order execution. Superscalar paper kind of also kind of touch multiple other topics like how do we actually add more ALUs? How do we how does the window actually work? How does the write back actually we it has all the detail. So that's why that paper is really good in a sense that it is a is a great example of how engineering paper can be researched, right? Uh, instead of discussing on the paper itself, I want to kind of draw the difference. So I, I'll touch like what I'm supposed to talk in the research methodology as well, but I want to kind of talk to both of you to 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 make sure you now see the difference between the two types of paper, right? They are more like I'm these are the idea and I'm gonna simulate this idea and so they kind of see okay is it better, and this is more like this is the design, right? This is the design and this is why it's really good, right? 
one thing you, you would notice is both types of paper, they, they give you something really new. That's called novelty, right? That's called novelty. And the reason why I want to bring this up is uh, unless you're talking to a, only a few selected people, at, at, even at TTGS and even at people at Aachen, they are not going to talk a lot about this novelty. Like you, to do good research, you need something novel. Like you, you're going to research on something totally, totally new. Um, and I want you, you to keep that in mind because applying concepts that you've seen before on a paper and write another paper on the same idea is not a paper, it's not research because someone already figured it out, it's not new. That's that element. So if you're wondering why some paper goes to like a, a, a venue that has really high impact, like a well-known, really not like really, really good venue, so in our case, we uh, as computer engineering, we like top conferences, right? That to be honest, I often write paper to those top conferences because I want to make sure things are new, right? I'm going to find what is going to be the contribution. For master students, like both of you guys, we are not going to expect like everything to be new, right? But again, when you write a paper, you need to identify what's new. So that's going to be a key. Uh, between acceptance and rejection, essentially. What's new? What have people not done before? Because those are important. You can't just copy another idea and, and, and apply it to your project and say, hey, that's a paper. That's bullshit. <laughs> Some people might think that way, especially whenever you talk to the people who misunderstood what is industry research. If you look at my uh, trail of publication, you see, I have my uh, industry collaboration all the time, all the time. Those those people actually want to also invent new things, right? So those are true industry research. If you say, hey, I'm going to try this technique on this particular application that has been proven on the paper to work, but I just want to launch a product, those are not research. I want you, you to see the difference. In this case, this paper is a really, really, really good engineering paper. This is a really good piece of research. And this is how you can write a good engineering paper. You invent, you engineer the heck out of the design, right? Uh, but you can also propose idea type of paper as well. So while you're reading the review, uh, doing this review, you can see multiple types of paper. You review the Yale Pad paper, right? The first paper, uh, first week. Those are more like a, we call it position paper. So it, it doesn't really give you new idea. It doesn't really engineer anything. It just say, hey, this is a trend. We should work on it, right? So those are position paper in the sense that these are typically written by senior people in the field who, who either work on multiple various topics and they start to see the trend that when they talk to the industry, when they talk to people with academia, they, they start to think that, hey, in the next 10 years, we're going to run into this wall, so we better solve that problem now, right? Another example outside of computer science are like mRNA, for example, right? We know that, hey, these things are really, really powerful, right? And and basically, they, they've been working on it for tens of years, right? Is that actually a, a not, a, not that new of a technology? But there's so many research piling on because people start to realize the power of doing certain things. So these are so the type of the paper you you've seen from the Yale Pad paper is a position paper. They kind of like predict the future. It every review on that paper always say I don't have enough background, right? So so that's kind of like a unique thing of a position paper. Typically, it is the the audience are people within the area. They are making the case for, hey, uh, my my friends in architecture, these are the problems that you might want to look into. So they will have already a lot of background. And when they read the paper, hey, that's an interesting direction. Maybe I should look into it. Great. Uh, there's also this uh, super scalar architecture paper, which is like an engineering paper. This is how we design things. 
many of the paper in the 80s and 90s are, are kind of like that. There's also like a, for example, branch prediction paper, which is more like a, an idea paper. It's like, this is what we want to do and this is how we achieve it, right? So there'll be a mix of, of all these types in the future and hopefully you find it uh, beneficial. Uh, I already toned down the number of reviews you have to do. So if you're already done enough, right, just treat the rest as extra credit. If you have time from the other classes, especially Muhammad, since you are taking four other classes, right, then feel free to read the paper if you simply do the review. Those are extra, extra credit. Uh, and, and just really take it to your advantage to kind of get the early start on the research methodology and like kind of like knowing how to explore, how to read paper. Uh, I appreciate that you you basically say that, hey, now that you read paper for like four or five weeks, things get faster. Right? It will get even faster and you will start to be able to identify uh, whether you want to read this paper or you want to skip to another paper. There are things you can do. Also, another trick I'll let you know is like sometimes paper also have presentation tied to the paper. You can find them. Presentation from the first author is always, most cases are the key message that the author wants you to know. So those are another good resource before you check out the paper they'll send you the key message to the presentation. But because presentation has time limits, sometimes it's not like complete comparing to a, a, a paper, right? So in that case, you want to figure out, okay, if I find this interesting, I'm going to check out the paper. And when you make your own presentation, sometimes you also have time limit. So you make sure the content and the key message is getting across, but interesting part, you need to make sure you point it out. Okay, if you're interested in this, feel free to refer to the paper. I'll be happy to discuss with it afterwards. So these are tricks when you can do a presentation, right? Uh, uh, if you have any questions on that, feel free to send me an email offline. I'll, I'll be basically, I'm, I'm handling the research methodology class next semester as well. So if you are curious about it, just send me an email, right? Uh, I, I, I might go, I'm a, I'm one of the more of the research side of people at TTGS, right? So I want to kind of encourage you guys to like actually look into this, right? I mean, it can be interesting. If you're done with master's degree, sometimes you have to read paper to implement whatever you learn from the paper on your project, right? So knowing how to do this is good. Uh, it's not notice. September 30th, uh, coming up in two weeks, make sure you know the basic material. If you have questions about anything, next week is a perfect time to ask. Uh, next week, as I said, I have to kind of like go through uh, an interview with this entity called AUNQA, which is basically is like they're trying to make sure we are having a program with a high standard. Somehow, you might also randomly get interviewed as well for, from these folks. Uh, this will be at 11:20, uh, so I have to finish the class a little bit early. I checked with the program uh, chair uh, in our department already, and and uh, I'm kind of informed that I have to be there, right? Even though I have a class. Uh, so yeah, so I will finish the class a little bit earlier next week. Give me a few seconds. My food is here. Sorry, I have a, I have to teach at noon, so <laughs> basically try to like order food so it arrives like and I have like ten minutes to finish my food. So yeah, I have to finish a little bit early next week. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry about that. If you have questions on the exam, I hope the one hour twenty minutes is enough to kind of cover those those. My expectation, I feel every semester we're done early whenever we do the review. Uh, again, the exam format, twenty four hours exam. Intention, if you look at a question, it should be done in three hours. So pick the hour slot that you feel you're free, work on the exam during those slots. Uh, and I'm going to be online during the class period for the three hours. If you have questions about the exam on clarification questions, you can't ask like, how do I do this? But you can ask like, what do I mean when I say, hey, this thing is fully pipeline? It means can I put things here? What do I assume here? If anything's unclear, 
if it's something that I cannot say, I'll tell you I cannot say that as far as the question. If it's clarity question and say like, hey, that's not clear, I will, I will clarify things up. All right. So that's it for the class today. Uh, we actually ended up uh, done earlier than I thought. I thought it'd be at like 11.45, 11.50. Uh, any questions that you want to ask? Uh Yes, sir. First thing is that uh, there uh, in the canvas, uh, I just checked that there is week six paper uh, list, but there is no slot to. Actually yeah, it should be up in uh, right after this class. So, uh, I just need to kind of update the, the due date. And uh, secondly, uh, you said that there uh, will be a two slides presentation of the uh, project. So I just want to discuss that with you in this. Uh, uh, oh yeah, sure. You can you can do it now if you want to. Let me share screen. Yeah. So while you're setting up, do you mind if I go into the the front yes. of my house to get my food and put it here? Yes. It should take yes. me like one minute. I'll oh, be sorry. right back. So let me unshare the screen and you feel free to take take over. Sure. Just to double check, I'm transitioning to my uh, desktop. Can you still hear me? Uh, yes, you can. Okay, perfect. Uh, I'll I'll get my food. I'll be right back. All right. Okay, go ahead. So, sir, uh, uh, I, what I uh, choose is that edge detection algorithms are uh, famous in image processing, and you need that in a lot of applications. And mm -hmm. uh, yes, I also worked on edge detection algorithms in, uh, in Python, but uh, I actually came up with the bottleneck that uh, I processed it serial serially, and uh, I. I thought to process that in parallel, but actually I do not have that uh, knowledge of parallel programming. So what I expect is uh, what the motivation behind this is to increase the FPS, first of all, uh, to by implementing the, this algorithm in parallel. Because I have uh, uh, reviewed a lot of papers and I will show you uh, up that paper and it says that uh, the performance increase if you implement uh, edge detection algorithms on GPU. So, mm -hmm. secondly, I uh, want to learn uh, parallel processing and CUDA programming. And okay. And so, are you gonna implement the algorithm in CUDA essentially? Uh, yes. Uh, okay, I'll perfect. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, so, I think it's a good project, uh, especially if it helps with your your main project. That's also even better. But I think at the minimum, you learn CUDA. You know how to. Uh, how to run things in CUDA and hopefully hopefully uh you know how to I, I guess optimize the CUDA code as well because I mean the first time you try to run it you, you might not see a, a good speed up right there may be some inefficiency that that happened on a GPU and, and it's, it's totally uh possible to kind of identify those and change the con like somehow you change the config, somehow you change the number of threads, somehow you change the algorithm itself to be more parallel friendly, and you will get speed up. I think edge detection is a good workload to try, actually. So it is good. So 
yeah, so I this is a good project. Uh, uh, secondly, I also want uh, that uh, uh, the first step will be to process the algorithm in parallel. And secondly, I also want to process the images in parallel. Uh, we we will take multiple images for, from the camera simultaneously. We will then process uh, each of the image separately, and in each of the image we will uh, uh, implement the algorithm in parallel. So I just want uh, uh, to learn that how to process images in parallel as well, and, and uh, to, together with the algorithm. So, okay. Yes. Uh, one, one, one quick thing that I want to ask of you. So right now for the edge detection algorithm, what, what kind of algorithm do you use? Are you converting things to the for a like uh, frequency domain and check for the high frequency component or? Uh, what uh, edge uh, explicitly what edge detection algorithm I am gonna work on is Kenny edge detection or the Sobel edge operator. Uh, okay. What, yes. Yeah. So those should work. Uh, so just double check that things are can, things can be done easily uh, in, in a data parallel way. Uh, my keyword data parallel. Uh, double check that on like Google. That is fine. Like data parallel model, it will give you the ability to to run really quickly on a GPU if you can write a program that way. So that would be like your your first step, to be honest. All right. Yeah. All right, anything else that you two want to ask? Otherwise, we basically that's it for the class. Uh, I think uh, that's it.